how you talk about uh, the aesthetic of atmosphere, the title is From Familia to Uncanny, Aesthetics of Atmosphere in Domestic Space. We are lucky because we have uh, more time for us. The notion of familia has recently become crucial in the debate generated by everyday aesthetics. Starting with Arthur Apalese in the audience and consolidating within the Eureka Psycho book, the notion of familia has been used to lay emphasis on the value of everyday life, often disregarded because it's normal. In our life, everyday space and objects often form a kind of background which intrigues us only when something strange happens. However, the value of what is familiar should not be under underestimated in as much as it may makes us feel comfortable and happy. In this essay, I will investigate the notion of familia and some Anthony notion I explained and can alien while investing in a phenomenological approach. My reference is the German phenomenologist Gerhard Böhmer and his theory of atmosphere. I will review two models of inhabiting, symbolically conveyed one by the Shell House and the other by the Glass House. In the popular imagination, the shell house is linked to the idea of familia, as much as it stands for protection, privacy, and warmth. Music aesthetics defines a musical work uh, as a deliberately produced, usually composed, musical object that is meant to be ultimately presented, an object with the following determining char char characteristics, as you can see. Other qualities of the musical work are related to aesthetics and aesthetic and artistic evaluation, such as identity, authenticity, integrity, aesthetics, intensity, formal complexity, unity, etc. It should be emphasized, however, that that is a purely European category of work that is valid for a limited number of works, opposites, of several centuries now no longer absolutely with regard to new compositional techniques, experiment, conceptual art, sound art, etc. Uh, in her definition, Sophia Lisa uh, also do not point to the need to expand the concept. Lisa has creatively reconsidered the conception of her teacher, Roman Ingarden, who has combined ontological and functional criteria, most, uh, most important of them, intentionality, composed and integrated, finiteness, emphasized, emphasized on the practice, on the uh, reception, fixation by notation, etc., etc. Music activity today is understood not only as the creator's or performer's activity, but also as the recipient's activity, though much more likely in the field of classical music imposing certain demands, intellect, experience, or listening. For the result of imaginative composing that can be recorded, we primarily use the well-established concept of musical work or music piece, composition, song, etc. However, we are surrounded by a lot of music to which the term doesn't relate appropriately. As you can see, a slide. Since not every artistic creation has to acquire the status of work of art for the above mentioned uh, Czechish uh, Aesthetician Ivan Polegniak proposes the term musical object. He means all that is a particular realization of music. Another term, musical expression, that is related to human activity as producing music, composing, improvising, interpreting, rather than to be the result itself. As a contradiction to the term musical expression, sometimes the term musical product appears. Here, the result is emphasized, not the process. It is important to realize that we need to look for new, more adequate concepts, as well as optimal models of the interpretation of music in terms of musical work, opus, 
and the music that lacks the status of musical works, non opus, and then such sound reality that cannot be regarded as art, meaning non art, etc. So we perceive reality through the lenses and via the logic of computer interface with its typical simultaneous multitasking and multi screen activities, and the new variant of a video essay documentary, critically investigates such a new social, economic, and cultural paradigm. Since uh, desktop documentaries in their appropriation and exploitation of heterogeneous digital data, files, and software do not exclusively depend on the materiality and physicality of the film medium, they represent a paradigmatic post-media practice. Now, during the last couple of uh, uh, decades, there are were written many theoretical books and papers on post-media and post-medium, but, but for this uh, short presentation, I will focus on several theses developed by Lev Manovich. So, uh, according to Manovich, the computer interface constituted a universal working space wherein for the first time in the history, identical tools or digital comments such as cut, copy, paste, etc., were equally employed in completely disparate art disciplines and different professions as well. One of the unprecedented key aesthetical innovations formed through the synthesis of personal computer and the internet was multimedia document, defined by Manovich as something which combines and mixes different media of text, photography, videos, graphics, and sound. So the traditional typology of mediums grounded in their respective material distinctiveness, you know, the classical dichotomy between spatial and temporal arts appear to be theoretically, discursively, and epistemologically obsolete and inadequate to explain novel artistic practices. In the era of dominance of computer technologies, multimedia platforms, and global networking, the filmmaking practice, and experimental and avant-garde cinema in particular, in different ways corresponds to the new digital standards. On one side, we have the pure negation of the digital, as is the case with those you know, committed individuals who still explore and exploit the possibility of the analog film medium. On the other side, we have the acceptance of the digital, albeit not without strong critical intervention. And one possible response to the contemporary challenges of post-media condition, belonging rather to the latter type, is represented by desktop documentaries. <laughs> During the last several years, desktop documentary format established itself as an exemplary post-media artistic or cultural practice. Kevin P. Lee, who coined the name for this new experimental genre, and his colleagues at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, involved themselves in the filmmaking practice, which, in their words, uses screen capture technology to treat the computer screen as both the camera lens and the canvas. So, uh, desktop documentaries are charting the multitude of the internet through the desktop interface, acknowledges, acknowledging the internet's role not only as a boundless repository of information, but as a primary experience of reality. Genre-wise, desktop documentary is mostly similar to essay film. For decades, essay film has been a truly hybrid filmmaking mode, a can tower as Philip Lope calls it, on the threshold between several film genres, exploring the personal, idiosyncratic viewpoint of its author, while unconventionally combining and confronting spoken or subtitled commentary with moving images and pictures. Both are focused on modernist and contemporary buildings selected for demolition in order to reuse their material components for radical design. This obsession was the worn out and wearing out of architecture is intended to question the standard approach of demolition to create a tabula rasa situation for new projects, not only to save material and energy from the landfill, but also to introduce a social point of view to keep the qualities that are already there, to improve on the existing and to remember the people and the events that took place. Material reuse encourage one to consider buildings as repositories, not just of the materials, but also of knowledge and past practices of crafting buildings. These past practices are also given as raw material, in this case of knowledge 
that might, um, that might find new applications and contribute to a new world system. Um, Rota's design approach addresses reusability and sustainability as a part of a political project. It formulates a critique of throwaway consumer culture and highlights how outsourcing products to go global supply chains from serious labor conditions resulting in depolitization de of forced working conditions and environmental costs. Okay. To counter this, Rota developed guidelines, protocols, and regulatory work for the reclamation of reusable materials and the integration of waste into the current building process. Transgressing the disciplinary limits of architecture, they research, design, and exhibit work in response to industrial production, consumption, and waste fabrication. Rota's national sur survey on existing second-hand building material dealers in 2013 showed the lack of firms uh, working with large-scale industrial materials of the 20th century, out of which Rota DC, the construction cons uh, consulting person, developed as an independent wing of Rota design activity. In 2015, Rota developed a Vademekum for off-site reuse, a model of legal and practical guidelines for the reclamation of reusable materials from public buildings in Belgium. In cooperation with a lawyer, they are also working on policies to reintroduce salvage building materials into the construction process of buildings with the European market. Here, the client is the European Union in Brussels because waste legislation is a public tendering and product norms are subject to EU policy. Rota hopes to dissect and redesign the material economy and its underlying legal and processual conditions, which could be understood as a political project. The purpose of this study is to examine the achievements and limitations of the neuroesthetics led by Samir Zeki. Specifically, this study first seeks to distinguish Zeki's research results, published from 1994 to 2017, into two periods the earlier and the later works. Then, the theoretical and practical aspects of such research results will be examined systematically. Finally, the key difficulties inherent in each of the works will be critically reviewed. Through this examination process, I seek to examine the entirety of Zeki's neuroesthetics, which has been discussed in a fragmentary manner from a single point of view, and to review its problems in a comprehensive manner. In addition, this paper offers a letter study as an alternative to Zeki's approach by accepting the aesthetic position of John Dewey as a theoretical and philosophical criterion of neuroesthetics. This study will hence show that the second generation neuroestheticians are overcoming some of the issues inherent in Zeki's research. Neuroesthetics is a field within contemporary empirical aesthetics that approach the questions of aesthetics from a scientific view. Neuroesthetics, which was first proposed by Zeki and later formalized as an independent discipline, is known as a new field of study born out of the rapid development of neuroscience at the end of the 20th century. However, the history of neuroesthetics is actually older and its direct roots lie in the tradition of experimental psychological aesthetics that Gustav Fechner had initiated in the late 19th century. Early neuroesthetics took the form of a descriptive approach that viewed nature of beauty and art in a speculative way based on previously discovered scientific facts. Conversely, the trend of experimental research based on direct observations using neuroimaging technology gradually came to the fore from 2004. Zeki's neuroesthetics can be divided into the earlier descriptive study, publications for which were concentrated in the period between 1994 to 2001, and the later study based on experimental methods using functional magnetic resonance imaging devices after 2004. <laughs>
After the introduction, I discussed about two types of the trends of the modern painting after the World War II. Uh, next, I will focus on a painter, Adania Masayoshi, who is regarded as one of the best modern painters in Okinawa. And then I'm going to show you the relationship between the modernism in Okinawa and the local church. As an introduction of this presentation, I will briefly explain about the history of the mo uh, Okinawa, Okinawa modern art. Uh, Okinawa is the most uh, southwestern prefecture of Japan, uh, while Okinawa is divided into several areas. The cultural main island of it is Okinawa Island. Uh, this presentation focuses on this main island. Uh, for the later discussion, I confirm the brief history of Okinawa. Okinawa. In 1890, 1879, Okinawa was officially put in under the Japanese government. Before that, Okinawa was an independent country, Ryukyu Kingdom. Uh, during the World War II, Okinawa led, had experienced the land battle. After this defeated battle, Okinawa had been under the U.S. military administration until 1972. The art during the period from 1945 to 1960s, I would discuss, had, had experienced an enormous change. Before the main subject, we should hold some conditions under which Okinawa art was. The first one is, of course, the memory of the battle of Okinawa. And the second is the cultural policy of the U.S. Furthermore, in this period, the trend of the Japanese art remained, uh, remained to be effective to Okinawan art. The last and the most important one is the Okinawan traditional aesthetics. We mainly think about this last point in the presentation. The aesthetical tradition of Okinawa, different from that of Japan, Japanese, uh, was the main topic for the post-war artists in Okinawa. And then I will introduce to you an artist, Adania Masayoshi, who is regarded as a tourist and the best modern painter in Okinawa. After he graduated a high school in Okinawa, he entered into the Department of Design of Tokyo Fine Arts School. After the World War II, Adania moved back to Okinawa and started his career as an artist. The feature of his painting is the integration of the local in Okinawa and the modern style of painting. He is also known as an educator for the foreign Okinawan modern painters, so he had influenced the younger generation. From the Olga Tokarczuk's novel, The Right Not Now Over the Bones of the Dead, where the entomologist uh, shows the protagonist the home of countless Lavai under the seducive bar. Uh, at that time, we thought that every wrong hand is still deserved, etc. Um, you can read it, the whole passage. Um, in answer to the question of how this attitude is completely manifested in literary works, I would say it is evidence in the relationship between literary representation, the structured world of actuality, and the concept of becoming. In the Lusitatarist philosophy, becoming denotes an endless process implying metamorphosis and interaction of the virtual points characterizing every being and object. Therefore, such narratives open up the world and only then represent, and consequently enable a variety of becomings. In terms of all two writers, becoming minoritarian, becoming human, and becoming animal. The Lusitatan is specifically emphasized that becoming man and becoming majority is simply not possible. Untimely is usually a positively valued indicator for works of art, as we used to say, but the lesson Gatari's untimely is another name for the mutuality, <coughs> participating in events. The, the less defining this in the logic of some sense as the extraction from modernity of something that relates to the modernity but which must also be turned against it in favor of the hope of a future time. Un untimely literary texts are multi-voiced narratives bringing all involved into new assemblage. This is the translation of French word 
Agence Simon. A critic of such work should focus on artistic creation which invents new conditions, that is literally work, not just reproducing rules, but constituting them, opening up texts to becoming. The implementation of such genre subversive process is seen in the work of Olga Kukarczuk, especially in Drive Your Cloud, which subverts the crime novel, and in most of Vera Smolnikar's subversions of the folk story, where she produces a new uh, genre of artificial adult only narratives in Muslim literature. Tokarczuk, speaking about her novel Drive Your Cloud, once said that it would have been a waste of paper and time to write a book just to finally reveal who the killer was. The book consists of 17 chapters, each introduced by a motto from Blake's Proverbs, most of which related to animals. In addition, the book, although a thriller, she says it's a psychological, uh, the author herself says this is a psychological, metaphysical thriller, where illustration is an exception rather than the rule, uh, this book is illustrated, from which one can infer the influence of Blake's so-called composite art. I've been uh, preparing some uh, material from the work uh, he uh, published prior uh, to the actual novel, which was uh, out in 1932. Because uh, what you can very successfully do is uh, you can uh, collect component parts, you can uh, locate these component parts, interestingly, in magazines, in uh, journal articles, uh, which paved the way to that novel. Harper's Bazaar is one of them, Vanity Fair, uh, another one. What point uh, is mindset uh, in terms of uh, cinema was the cinematic uh, landscape in the 1920s, uh, 1930s, uh, basically, uh, in England. But also, he got a bit of an intake from uh, the United States. Uh, he's writing uh, about uh, the Margate the cinema, which is part of uh, the Dreamland uh, cinema uh, landscape, which is uh, situated uh, at the coast. So this opened in uh, 1935, three years after the publication of uh, Brave New World. Uh, what we can extract uh, from this uh, is actually uh, the inspirational source that uh, he received for his novel from uh, the Art Deco uh, environment, which already gives strong uh, impulses uh, and hints towards uh, his vision. Um, he uh, is circumscribing the year uh, 3000 in uh, an article entitled The Outlook for American Culture, Some Reflections uh, in the Machine Age. This is as early as 1927. So he's referring to trust uh, monopolies who are actually uh, developing uh, a network of uh, the recreational uh, industry. And um, uh, he is uh, fearing that the play instinct and uh, the modes of the creative impulse and uh, expression are not. And they come uh, to a standstill. His main concern is the free human will, which is obviously disadvantaged by the intrusion of the American uh, entertainment culture. He defines immersion almost in a <coughs> lexical uh, in an etymological way in, in 1923. Um, he states in Pleasures, which is published in, uh, on the margin, like countless audiences soak passively in a tepid bath of nonsense. No mental effort is demanded uh, of them, no participation. They need only sit and keep their eyes open. Devastating statement. The which is related to uh, uh, transition of Russian socialism in the postmodern age in the fourth of the century. Uh, according to knowledge, the Old Testament was never interested in art, precisely because it didn't come to know the gate. It was finally looking to the promised land, and that is why it is not an object. That's why Jesus came to say the kingdom of God is among us, uh, which means not a 
Here he states the iconography issue of the author's Christianity, which is the, the main feature of that. And uh, in that respect, how he is a philosophy of art, is the energetic theology of like, which means the continuity of his work in aesthetics. Uh, well, that's clear that it was the exact position that was belonged to the icon. Uh, stated in such a place you must stay back. This here, this is the last exhibition in Moscow in 1915, which is post 1910, which is the, the start of the artistic event. There was presented the text we are in before the point of down, which is about the origin of the geometrical system. It was icon not only due to the place, but also to the significance of the whole conception of the, of the exhibition. However, such art, does not state any of Schroeder's personality because there is no human state that makes a personality based. Observer is neither in the center of the English nor of the border of the in place, <coughs> speaking by a dynamic <coughs> substance that is the power geometry of the, of the whole conception. So the Russian monogram restored the iconography paradigm in order to avoid the representation of art of the modern age. And there are two, uh, three uh, important uh, features of iconography, which should be considered which are perspective, colors, and geometry. When we talk about iconography, we talk about something like this, you know, what it was something like this that is a modern painting. Uh, which is the crucial difference is the perspective, which we can see the iconography is yes, something that is called an iconographic perspective that is mine, spirit now it's in the interior. And in that respect, uh, a binocular vision, which is a blend of two images from different points of view, Give some interesting results in that, in that respect. In that way, the futuristic discussion, especially that one of continuum, continuum is, is given, having a depth in the that goes to the plane domain. And what next, however, to, to remain to, to, think, to get the uh, uh, substantial geometry of icon is not objective, because I don't want to represent reality, but it's about the knowledge of creation. But it was in the chaos. The humanity is an uh, operation of hypothesis of one card that is the chaos starting of the map. She gives a grief as a paradigm of the neural stage, which said that the originality is uh, related to repetition, continual repetition. And concerning the substantial element of icon, uh, this uh, grid structure is related to substantial special abilities that divine the neural scales which should be related. Through impulses of modernity, we had during the years uh, 60s another jewels, if I may say so, that in this period of transition from, uh, from socialism to neoliberalism has permanently been changed. So one example is the work of Yugoslav architect Petar Bolić. So this paper provides an examination of aesthetics and theory conceived for his National Bank building in Cetinje, and it explains how this important monument of Montenegro modernism was changed during the period of transition from socialism to modernism to paradoxically become nothing less than the museum of art and contemporary art. So this critical examination of strategic uses of a public space in socialist Yugoslavia versus today's interest-based uses of the same in capitalist society, even when they paradoxically might serve counter and art, can show us and speak about the time we are living in. To raise our critical awareness, is this the right way or not? As the paper pr uh, principal result, the issue of what we can call a self-vanished modernism becomes visible. You just don't have to learn about it. You see and live the transformation. Since the National Bank is not the only object in Montenegro that has permanently changed in our geography. In our everyday consumerist life approaching the end of the second decade of the 21st century, there are not so many elements that are making the relation between economy and art or culture and economy in a broader sense perceivable. At least in post-socialist countries, for an ordinary citizen, art is still something exclusive and deprived of any tangible relation when it comes to influencing real life. These two sectors of reality construction economy and culture 
are perceived as distant and unconnectable. But if we look more attentively in the past of both, we can find traces of a time, of a time and of thought when the opposite was taking place. Uh, the times of socialist progress and socialist thought in the case of the Yugoslav state, whose unused potentials are still today being scrutinized for development and understanding of our present days, days in terms of both culture and economy. Building of the national bank in Cetine was conceived and designed by the author Petra Bulovic. It was constructed between 1960s and 1964, partly in parallel with his development of the architect pro uh, project in Makarska in Croatia between 1962, uh, 60 and 62, with which we can trace uh, slight aesthetics. And Golkin believed that the passion belonged to desire. A secret risk example is a story about Leotis. It's Leotis' anger. He, uh, who is angry because his desire to watch the dead body on the uh, on the uh, square. It shows that passion is not a desire and not even a, a lie to desire. There is also he a secret risk. Another example about the newborn baby and the dogs. It also shows that passion is not rational. Secret by seeing the passion is an emotional will, and that will a man's desire is more powerful than his reason. He a woman, uh, the man's desire is more powerful than his reason. He will be angry at the power within him, and that he will fight for the victory for the justice when he received the injustice. So Sagrid see human passion as an ally of reason, and the three parts of the soul friendly to each other, so it will achieve the individual, individual harmony. And Kant further developed Sagrid in his critical of Particle reason, exploring that how the poor reason balance desire and reason in a proper order, and thus we can obtain happiness. Okay. And here comes the. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and here comes to the conclusion. A general speaking, in order to bridge the gap between paradigm and reality. Positivism uh, will dilute the paradigm, but uh, as paradigm is a yardstick that can be used to measure things, it feels we cannot reach the standard, we can get close to it. And Plato, and the idealism based on the principle of justice, is still influenced the political philosophy of today, and what separates what Plato leaves us it's a very conscious play. And the play is about thinking and the reality, the consciousness, and it is clear, symbolic expression in the existence of the philosophers. And uh, ours, as a regional and limited being, we still have a long way to go. And thanks for your attention. The fundamental principle of the pedagogic at the Bauhaus, one of the most seminal educational institution for modern design was Einheit. This principle was paraphrased without the issue the development of the Bauhaus. Walter Gropius, the first director, advocated the integration of various arts and crafts in architecture and the cooperation between art and technology and also the unity of workers in collaborative, collaborative production. Next director, Hannes Meyer, radically promoted the systematic unification of the mechanized production lines. Although these typical phrases are indeed widely used to relation to the Bauhaus, they do not completely present the significance of the experiments at the Bauhaus. In Uh, 
acknowledged the prospectus brochure appealing to the applicants with the slogan. Young people come to the Bauhaus. On the street, a new slogan, the human being at the iron height, appeared accompanied by couples of the keywords mind, soul, and body soul. It is not worth it that iron height here does not mean the integration of things nor the collaborative work of the group, but rather the genetic condition of individual persons. On the same spread, two images depict the kinetic human figures were laid out. One, one, is a, one was a photographic study of Lux Feilinger, a student from Lazaro Momo Energy's class, and the other was the, uh, uh, the other was Oscar Schremer's diagram about drawing man in the sphere of ideas. Tom Meister and E. and Schremer considered that each pattern, the most primary act of formative creation, should not merely construct a certain material shape, but should organize the modus of the human being in itself. They raised a question, what kind of human figure will be needed in the near future? Or more fundamentally, what is the human being? Thus, their inquiry came to necessarily involved in an anthropological issue. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, local uh, Polish artists from the region of Upper Silesia. It's a region uh, very close to Krakow, where the Congress was held uh, six years ago. And uh, I would like to um, uh, present a thesis which is rather far from the typical narration connected with such a region as uh, Upper Silesia. Because Upper Silesia is so-called post-industrial region. So it's full of problems like uh, polluted air, polluted ground, uh, uh, closed uh, coal mines, iron works, uh, uh, people losing work. Uh, and usually we tend to talk about such regions in terms of melancholy, of sadness, of, of reflection, nostalgia. And today I would like to say something optimistic. <laughs> and uh, I would like to present the region uh, in the light of uh, uh, in the light of um, idea of industrial landscape as a sphere of transition, as a sphere of, uh, of environment of transformation of the self. Uh, I'm going to uh, do this by works of local, local Salesian artists uh, Mona Tush and Raspadian, but I'm going also to uh, show you some uh, uh, paintings of uh, esoteric painters who inspired them directly. Those esoteric painters painted in the 50s of the uh, 20th uh, century, and they were called Yanowska Mu. Okay, uh, what you see here is a mural of uh, Rasta, by Raspasian, it's one of the mentioned artists. It's uh, located in the city of Katowice. I think it's uh, fancy enough to be placed uh, everywhere in the world. And in fact, Raspasian paints his painting uh, in many different locations uh, in the world. However, it's not only attractive, but it also has second life. There is a hidden dimension in this mural. And I would like to now uh, show you some details. Uh, the features are hidden in the picture, as you can see. We can see a Saturn emblem here on the right side, that is the planet Saturn. We can see also a very strong occult symbol, the black cube, on the bottom down corner, and the stars. We see snake heads covering human heads. We also see ancient masks at the top. And the miner's handler, which is very often for Rastasian, on the chest on the right side. First, the mirror for reflecting our own painter should not be too small or too big, but just the size of our slums. Second, it should be transparent, that is, it should make visible things before or we behind it. Hang itself invisible. Similarly, in Ivana, the flower should not be too large or strong, but proportionate to the arranger's capability. And it should, and it should not be too self-starting, but 
more depth enough to allow a range of ideas to penetrate. He must regard flowers as a mirror when he arranges them. In a mirror, the subject who sees is the object who sees. He sees himself through the mirror without it being seen in itself. This applies to the act of arranging flowers. In the flower as the mirror, the arranger as the subject of arranging recognizes himself as the object of arranging. His grasp is expressed in this way. This is how he gives an original right to flowers and becomes one with them, electing other to schools in which he only aims to revive them. Therefore, he must do three things when he arranges it. First, he regards flowers as a mirror. Second, he expresses his own grasp of them. And third, he becomes one with them. Conclusion In the theory of software, a flower is the partner to the arranger in expressing himself. He arranges it to discover and express himself in, in bringing out his characteristic beauty. So both the arranger and the flower play the leading role, thus linking up the Kibana together. As in the Center for Biomodern Studies, 2000, my, this year, 2019, at the uh, Moscow University of Slovenia. Now, oh, you may ask me, what is Biomodern? And maybe no one has thought about it. What's the real one? Oh, I introduced beer more than in three uh, sections. One, and beer in Chinese. The two, beer in minority. Yeah, three, beer in art. With video and uh, software. Bit in Chinese, bit in modern has multiple meanings. Literally, it means not aware of wrong and right words. No, it's felicity. Felicity is a reference to all world or another predecessor. And it's not a strategy of beer, it can be so many meanings. And as a character be at first has pressed the connotation of making bomb and flesh separate. The world was then expounded to have more meanings, such as no, different, distinct, farewell, another, awkward, separate, other one, and etc. However, means meaning in meaning. And, uh, the dynamic term uh, to need to be defined, especially in the concrete uh, context. Be is currently the Chinese version. At least uh, have uh, two thousand years. There are lots of writings tell of the be. Then is one ancient Chinese hieroglyph uh, fix. In summary, after Turbo created the deck brush, he shot the film and later wrote the scenario definitive edition and revised it. That is the eighth document of Turbo Turbo Vision that the screenplay was finally published. Then I would like to compare the deck brush before shooting with the eighth document and revised script after shooting. Please take a look at tablets in various modes. So it's too difficult to see. I'm sorry. As you can see, there is a clear difference in style between the deck brush and the revised script. Let's look at the first example. 
This is a short of opening sequence where the description of the deck flash in the cinema captures the Eiffel Tower. In the revised script, it is a long shot of a district, district of Paris dominated by the Eiffel Tower. Also, in the second example, where the description of the deck flash is we are in a cold day and do not enter the classroom with the camera, but the door is a little open so we can see inside them. The revised version of the script is divided into the scene of stairs and corridors and the scene of lecture class and the beginning of the description of the shot is it's a lecture room. What we can infer from those examples is that the important things about the deck flash is on who or what it was to. Even more characteristic is the use of the word we in deck flash as in example 2. Let's look at example 3. This is the scene where Arlito is a detective and the hero and one get out of the scene and leave the cafe and then the camera is left there and the state of the shown through the window. There is also a description of the watching. In the revised edition of example 4, it was written in the same way as the deck flash. We are in the office. However, in the manuscript of which the revised script was best, it was written as long shot in the room, and it was further rewritten to the sentence now. That is why it is clear that Turco was particular about the style of writing. So far, they have analyzed the deck brush before filming and the device version of the final screen play after filming. Of course, it is natural that there is a difference between the two, but it can be said that the difference is presence or absence of description of good point, which is a characteristic of Turco script material. In addition to describing where the camera is taken from, I also pointed out that there is a viewpoint other than that of the characters that is viewed. So how is this related to the film? So as I told you that the first issue of the same show drawn by Nagaluma, that time, uh, at the uh, the 19th century saw the rise of magazine as a popular form of literary journalism as well as a film of movement and literature in Europe due to the improvement of the press technology. And also in Japan, since the end of the 19th century, magazines in general played an important role on the process of modernization, especially in literature. And interestingly, you can see uh, many Japanese literature magazines use, use image of Western art movement, especially art nouveau and building So what we now see is uh, on the left is uh, the, the sketch by the Alphonse Lucia and the right is the cover of one of the called Shinkon Building. So they really imitated everything. Why are they using this image in the literature magazine? So as at that time, in the period of literature, the emergencies of many magazines were overlapped with the time and place for films to an old style of writings into modern literature. And especially, they, they said that it, it, it is important to unificate, to have a unification of the written and spoken language. So this is because all the writing system is a different. So, but they declared that it's the time to, you need, you need, uh, to, you need to have an indication of the right written and spoken language. And also, it's also important, uh, in the process of modernization, they also kind of try to express I, so like more individualization. In which uh, Shamanka, the shaman, the woman shaman, embodies the contemporary version of shamanism, it's uh, clear visible upon uh, the first side, the, the first side that uh, the life of uh, the main uh, female character uh, is uh, archaic and uh, chaotic, 
uh, she's involved uh, in a ritualized process from the past to present and the shaman uh, because uh, because uh, in the film there are also uh, the sense of uh, there is the corpse of real uh, shaman uh, but uh, it's uh, an interesting mix of time uh, because uh, uh, the other and the both time inter is interrelated with the ritualized culture, with folk culture of young people of the uh, early 90s of the 20th century. And uh, uh, also he makes uh, some references to the archaic mystics. It should be emphasized that there is a graffiti on the walls uh, in Shamanka is associated with old ornaments. The sexual life of the main character is revealed as a kind of magic practice. Zhuwatsky uses horror, mystics, uh, eroticism in the inseparable balance of uh, sensual image. In the order to create explicit ritualized form, he refers to the archaic sense uh, of taste uh, in the based upon the synesthesia and the hyperesthesia according to Nathalie de Graaf, uh, it is explicitly exposed uh, while the schema uh, of um, this uh, women character eats their fast food at the beginning as well as the end of the film and uh, uh, just one minute. Uh, and, and the end of the film and uh, also uh, while walking uh, she deals with uh, she deals with the meat. David Mukoli connects good walkability and functioning public sphere. One of the values of ambient in the urban environment is the face-to-face -face contact that it encourages as the walker moves from place to place. This interaction has been historically vital to a well-functioning democratic society, where a public sharing of ideas, beliefs, and concerns among citizens needs to occur on a regular basis. I endeavor to articulate that uh, political participation and participation in the public sphere can be part of our seemingly private experience of the city and our urban everyday life. In our everyday life, we negotiate the meanings and values purely by being perceived. As Hannah Arendt writes in the human condition, being perceived is to be perceived as who, not what. That is, it is about being understood in the difference and particularity of a person with a similar historical point of view. Hermeneutic situation, as Hans Georg Gadebach would call it. Arendt understands public sphere as a shared space of appearance. To be deprived of it means to be deprived of reality, which, humanly and politically speaking, is the same as appearance. Above all, it is about the mutuality of opportunity for people to be seen in their particular. Being seen and heard by others derive their significance from the fact that everybody sees and hears from a different position. This is the meaning of public life. Well, today I will speak on uh, history of humor, and there is a list of uh, articles and books devoted uh, to uh, this issue. However, I've mean, written a lot of books, especially in the history of English, American, and French literature. So this is only part of history. Thank you. Well, uh, as you can see in this paper, I will consider the issue of the individual and public aspect of the humor. In particular, I will deal with the relation of the unique content and social appeal of humor. From this perspective, I consider the principal features of Louis François Casamian detailed uh, and I would say very sensitive concept of the mechanism of humor. Developing uh, uh, André Bergson's concept of the comic 
in general and Bergson's remarks on the nature of uh, humor in particular. Uh, here you can see one passage from uh, Bergson's Laughter in the Vegan, uh, which is a uh, very important uh, inspiration for uh, Kazamian's thoughts uh, devoted to the question of uh, humor. Uh, I will not read it, uh, it's, I would say, quite well known, but uh, I will consider uh, this. Uh, notions basically in the particular as well. Okay. Gazamian uh, shows that humor is a specific kind of the comic transformation of uh, language. Gazamian emphasizes that humor as a specific kind of comic transformation of language consists in the conscious suppression of a natural reaction to reality by a natural and natural response, which is expressed by spoken or written language. The response of example of the uh, was an example to uh, how lucky the Sicilian religion was changing in several states. But the religion of one was part to be the identity of the religion was not subsequently inhibited. His personal effort was overridden without sufficient administrative support. Uh, my final point is, my final point is, uh, my final point is that how regarding the Zivilina and who is granted is in all Zivilina have a problem in common. My father sees a problem in how the one pure white cell is darkening and turning gray this time. This is because of the construction of this work, which was commenced in 1984, was extended in 1989 due to the budget of the fish, and they were surrounded to, to follow all time. Uh, this point uh, disconnect with the problem of time and that we could believe in hyper and Nagai's interpretation, interpretation of Louis work. Here the time the time process and extracting an altered form of material uh, mentioned by Nakai become a decisive decisive since the medium use of the ground plate was thin. Cement normally darkness, darkness, blacks, and become cut out with weeds in time. We need examining uh, this work with us changing in my opinion. The perspective carried on those in the middle of 20th century, but with the topics extended. They talked about the relationship between reality and socialist realism and did the comparative study between writing the reality and writing the essence. So try to, and try to summarize the tendency of differential and art and the reality in different kinds of art. Reflecting life according to the true uh, nature of life became a mainstream in the field of literary criticism. It was a widely accepted view that literature needs reality and it is the field of reality. At the same time, there was a typical dialectical thinking in theory, which was influenced by pre previous arguments. It was a widely focused issue of <coughs> reality and the Bible. There were three typical answers. One was positive for insisting that if the basic requirement of literary, literary theory and the basic feature of artistic works they thought artistic reality is the essence of life. Others argued in the negative. They thought it would lead to naturalism in the process of creation. The literary creation should be abstracted and not be limited to representing the very details of life. The third view is neutral. They thought other elements are as important as artistic reality. I think that might be a tricky question confusion of artistic Relative with naturalism. For one on the one hand, it is the 
I saw the ball costume from what is artistic reality is, and on the other hand, it avoids the disciplinary of whether well the truth of advocating artistic reality. In both discussions, we should see that in most cases, people would like to avoid some preconditions like artistic reality is objective and precise artworks, and it couldn't be recognized and understood. And the proposed and the method of creation is in expression and all uh, representation. Although there was no apparent uh, watershed of some great change, we can still find that in thinking about this concept tended to go back to literary support. They gradually got rid of grand uh, perspective of discussion. The ideas and perspectives to some extent had diversity. In the field of criticism, there were articles on specific viewpoints of white writers of artistic reality or on the narrativity and the fictionality of specific texts. In the field of theory, papers on um, authority of artistic reality appeared. For example, Zhu Liyuan and Hu Jingzhi talked about this issue in the late 1980s. And some papers focused on the history of the concept of reality or truth in Chinese art. Zhu Liyuan compared the, de the development of this concept between different art traditions from the generative perspective. And Han Hong Hai explored the origin of the concept in traditional literary theory. This occurred after the middle of the 1980s. Uh, you know about this very famous case. It was Bridford Fushi versus the United States. And it was one step toward the regime produced the original. Because you know the bird in space, the custom officers uh, consider that this old yellow object and they charge it as a kitchen and hospital supplies. So he went the case to the court and it was judged that it is art. So abstraction and mechanically produced art gave a legal status. So we introduced the concept of mechanically kind of produced art. And this is about a little bit about neuroscience. So the main things are emotion, perception, imaginary memory, and language. Those are these brain areas which from network interactions produced aesthetic experience. But what we need for them is that flexible architecture that produces art. Tight bonds produces culture. Artificial intelligence will, in the future, make very clear distance between art and culture. So culture is what we know, art is what we need to evolve. That's my question. Okay, next. And this is one thing, one thing uh, when minimal signals of artistic expression was first introduced, and its main brain experiment was in the 60s. It uh, occurred simultaneously in Europe, America, and Japan. It basically, the time when water was introduced, so engineers, and IBM, and other big factories, Siemens, uh, gave the opportunity for their bosses to experiment with it. So, what is important for us in, in uh, Serbia and Yugoslavia is that mainframe computer exhibitions, the, the very big one, were cybernetics rapid in London in 68, then then Singapore in Zagreb in 69, and computer Iran is the annual in 70s. And then in Zagreb basically mixed computer art uh, with the minimal art. So Kniffer exhibitions with the meander were on the exhibition. And uh, this is about uh, computer and information-based aesthetics, uh, which is all about minimal signals, but limited computing at that time of many pay, and limited time which you can access the computer, uh, bring it that all those works were rigorous in computing, efficient in algorithms, radical in rationalism, and minimalistic and use minimalistic aesthetics. I will now show you the, some of the examples. 
And this is the most important part of all. It was a question from the previous panel, and that was uh, the core of the information based stack. R as a model part. So it's from the 1971, made by Mark Spence. And this is the example of a student school from 60s, and especially a woman early in the 70s, Vera Molnar, Hungarian, resided in Paris. The distribution of power, architectural objects are mostly ordered by ruling ideologies and they actively form public opinion. If you look at Berlin under the influence of Nazi regime, we can see that the history of architecture is the same as the architecture of the ruling class. Everything was built and a commission that went hand in hand with the ideological goals of the state. The constructions had to reflect the idea of thousands of years old right, positioning to its size and power. Architecture symbolizes and executes political, social, and economic functions. In the past, totalitarian regimes such as Nazism, Fascism, and Stalinism used architecture in a propagandistic way to convey ideological messages to animate their audience with a monumentality, strict symmetry, and so on. The regimes desire to build forms that represent their ideologies. Some example of the is the Red Army uh, Theater in Moscow, shaped like a communist star, and the symmetrical new right chancellor in Berlin. Progress is slower in architecture than in other forms because uh, art forms because it, uh, of uh, its dependency on political and financial 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 power. Most done of parts of the 1920s and 1930s was the one of the most influential squares in Europe until it was destroyed by the bomb uh, during the Second World War. When the Berlin Wall was uh, built, the uh, Fort Dumbarton became an empty and isolated place. After the fall of the wall, it was again transformed and reanimated by the needs of the, the new capitalist ideologies. Today, Fort Dumbarton is owned by four mega corporations. The, co the complete diversity of buildings is controlled by these uh, four companies. Uh, the right of the city now falls into the hands of the interest of mega corporations, and the city is uh, in possession of new dominant ideology, the ideology of capital. Today, culture and art are not, not only elements of historical idealization, they are used by multinational mega corporations as a form of advertising. These corporations buy art objects and collections sponsor cultural uh, events and participate in cultural programs. They do this to hide the fact that their main goal uh, is just to promote uh, the accumulate of capital. In the all, uh, in the all to re-establish post as an in international meeting point and cultural center, Diamond Prizer is this year uh, again presenting the People Festival. It is a weekend uh, of cultural events first set up in 1999 masked the fact uh, that the reason for existence of this corporation was simply the production increased the all the time. Uh, this capital doesn't return back as a form of collective benefit and often adds to social inquiry. The cultural events are promoted as a form of social benefit for the public, but the public of these events is not a collective social body, it includes only those who can afford to know uh, and visit the commercial orient post ones. Architecture shapes uh, space in cultural, phenomenological, and ideological sense. Architecture represents a union of lines, materials, and uh, surfaces, which, are, which in their combination and interaction create a physical and visual form. This form is the basis on which the new space and context are defined. In this space, there is a field on action, for instance, the realization of ideology. Architecture has the power to transform words and concepts, control and regulate space that surrounds us and the way to define us.
uh, are the heat waves and social injustice just one of the impacts of the building materials used largely after the revolution of modernist architecture? So you see a lot of provocation here. So, um, Benjamin uh, defined architecture in many ways, uh, but um, I would like to stop on two notions. One is uh, architecture as a social art, and the other is architecture as a cosmogoria. So in his work, Walter Benjamin provides an overview of the paradigmatic cases of architecture and its impact in the 19th century, which is for him a constitutive period of modernist architecture. Benjamin was the coding modernity starting from the interconnection between a historical oriented experience on one hand and the material presence of aesthetic objects. Aesthetic was for Benjamin, following the steps of Karl Marx and enlarging his focus, the key element to understand modernity. By selecting specific cases within aesthetics, he was proposing here quote again small individual moments which work as the pistol of the total event, or to put it more uh, easily plain, <coughs> architecture was for him a microcosmos for reading the complexity of the society at large uh, and of his age. So Benjamin establishing a close correlation between aesthetics and the urban, where the shelf of modern living culminates. He wrote numerous uh, memoirs and articles and essays on the late Moscow, Marseille, and Athens, of course, Paris. And I should return to the topic of the metropolis at the end of this paper. So in his famous uh, essay, The Work of Art in the Age of the Mechanical Reproduction, Benjamin draws an architecture which he defines as a special type of art. Architecture is different from other arts because it fulfills a human need of a shelter. Thank you. Paul, again. So, buildings have been men's companions since primordial times. Many art forms have developed and perished, but the human need for shelter is lost. Architecture has never been evil. Its history is more ancient that, than that of any other art, and its claim to being a living force has significance in every attempt to comprehend the relationship of the masses to the art. Benjamin emphasizes here in an apparently evident position at the beginning of the 20th century, that the essence of architecture is primarily and foremost to build a shelter, so it works as a social art. Benjamin, nevertheless, focuses on architecture mainly in his life work, the Arcades Project. Uh, and although he develops many important arguments here, we only use two topics from this last work, which has more than 1,000 pages. So one is Phantasmagoria, and the other are the luxurious shops in Paris, now as the arcades, as the perfect embodiment of, his, of this Phantasmagoria. So Phantasmagoria could be understood as, quote, an exhibition of optical effects and illusions of constantly shifting, complex succession of things seen or imagined. And also, a grand quote, a phantasmagoria can be a scene that constantly changes and also a bizarre or fantastic combination, collection, or assemblage. Phantasmagoria within the work of Benjamin means as well some kind of a mystical force that converts an individual into a consumer. So, um, he was he would write a lot of text about the arcades, I will just pass through quickly. So, the arcades are the four items of the department store. Uh, and he said, he wrote, so the arcades are houses of passages having no outside, they are like a dream. They are the elaboration of architectural expression of the 19th century Paris, which at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution creates a new specific imaginary of modernity. This new public space works as a separate structure where all the shops are put under the same roof for the first time, which forms radically new type of consumerism and communication. With that, they are the phantasmagoria of communication as such. So I can argue that the arcades are the privileged embodiment of phantasmagoria for Benjamin precisely because they produce a yearning for a utopia, which could take place only in this specific space that is built up with, this, with artificial materials. Benjamin also underlines the problem of the awakening of the individual within the simulacrum of the metropolis of the 19th century. These simulacra are organized by the capital in order to set the phantasmagoria as the new reality, as the new real of the modern age. 
In this case, architecture is observed as the privileged setting of Phantasmagoria rather or because of its close bond to capitalism. In art, um, Malevich, uh, Kandinsky, and Mondrian create an independent universe of geometric images which concentrate the sense of meaning and logic regardless of the external reality. They use geometry for representing the relations in nature, aiming to produce an emotion instead of a mimetic presentation of the outside world. This shows the strength of geometric presentation and the effect it produces. Human mind always tries to define a sense behind the pure optical impression. Our mind, together with the eye, always seeks for understandable structures which show or seem to show sense in themselves. So, basing the composition only on straight lines, uh, as you can see in this picture, this is one of Mondrian's uh, works of art. Um, he constructs the structural relation of balance and harmony of opposites. When this concept is compared to the ones in architectural structures, the conclusion emerges that each element has its position in the geometrical grid. If a structure doesn't seem logical, it cannot be good. On this slide, we can see a concept uh, of the architect Bar Buckminster Fuller. Um, for him, uh, the geometrical grid is one of the methods for defining forms. So he is using platonic solids, as you're all familiar with. Uh, and his projects um, can be perceived as form and structure at the same time. His work was based on five-fold symmetry derived from nature, animal exoskeletons, and microorganisms. Up until now, um, there were only basic principles of geometry were used. Uh, everyone knows the Euclidean geometry of three planes and the platonic solids. But when Einstein made a shift in perception of time and space, uh, the concepts of geometry have also changed. So now we have uh, this curvilinear geometry or non-Euclidean geometry, which is um, based on um, the curvature of space. Uh, and it, this is incorporated in the computational tools. And these computational tools have now given architects the means to design and build spatial concept, concepts that would have been inconceivable even 10 years ago. So this is a citation from last year. So imagine like from 2008 and up till now, uh, these um, building information modeling programs can export all the necessary data for construction of complex building forms. So what was once the matter of craftsmanship, now is the matter of technology. So one of the very important concepts in architecture is that form follows force. So here presented on this slide, uh, we have um, the projection of the forces that uh, on a curved plane uh, that appear as a Voronoi diagram uh, and that every force can now be calculated even in complex forms.